stand by. This is Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel for SMEs, business owners, and entrepreneurs. Streaming live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. The live show is made possible by our sponsor, Restream, the easy way to stream to multiple social platforms at the same time. Restream Studio makes it simple to go live directly from your browser. Get started now at businessconnectionslive.com forward slash restream. And now, here's Steve Highland. Hello there, welcome along. It is Steve Harley with you here. This is Business Connections Live, the program for entrepreneurs, SMEs and business owners. And it's fantastic to have you with us in this unprecedented week that we are all living through as a country. Uh, welcome along to the program. I hope you're going to enjoy it. I hope you're going to find the information that we're going to be talking about useful today. Uh, we're going to be looking at the commercial invoice and why it's so important when it comes to customs declarations. It holds a unique role in that area. And I needed an expert because we are rapidly approaching, of course, uh, the end of the transition period. In fact, I heard on the news this morning that I think a Scottish M MP is asking for an extension to transition, but I think it's written in law that that can't actually happen. But it just goes to show you we're in, um, we are in a strange place at the moment uh, when it comes to the way transition is working, what COVID is doing to us, and uh, what you need to be ready and prepared to do in the new year. So that's why we're doing this program today. It gives you an opportunity, a bit of a heads up to figure out uh, the key things that you should be looking at and the key things that you should be doing. Uh, my guest on today's show is Linda Bazant. Linda, lovely to have you with us on the programme today. Uh, welcome along to the show. It's going to be a busy one today, isn't it? Thank you, Steve. Yes, it is. And we've only got 11 days to go. <laughs> I do know on your website that there is actually a countdown uh, on your website. You just you're not trying to to phase anybody or to to get them on edge, but I mean they're going to be pretty crucial these eleven days at the moment between with the negotiations. But it does seem that we are in a bit of a stalemate, doesn't it? At the moment, the uh, both sides. Who's going to blink first? Really, is the question, isn't it? I think so, Steve. But the thing is that, that that's pretty typical of most negotiations at this level. Um, every time we get a deadline, so for example, it was meant to have been Sunday, uh, the 20th of December, and I think everybody knew that that wasn't going to happen. And it would just really keep going right up and uh, uh, right up to the wire until, as you say, somebody blinks first. I know this isn't really your case, and it's not the kind of thing that you do, but uh, do you think uh, that they may throw maybe fishing under a bus, or do you think they'll come to some form of uh, nearly nearly like licensing, which I suppose in a roundabout way is a tariff system or a quota system. I mean, what's your feelings about this? Or do you think we will stand firm as a sovereign nation and uh, we will say, look, that's the way it's going to be, like it or lump it? I think what you'll find is we have to remember that we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes because we're not around the table. And a lot of what you're seeing is speculation from the media as to exactly what's going to happen. I, I don't think that they will throw fishing under the bus. I think that there will be some sort of prolonged arrangement, perhaps, where maybe we even continue talking into the new year, possibly about fishing. Um, but I, I, I think one of the other issues, of course, is uh, the state aid issue and the fact that the EU are saying that they want to be able to bail out their countries effectively, but we can't bail out our industries here. And uh, that is unfair. We're a sovereign nation. We should be able to uh, look after our own effectively. But having said that, and uh, within most free trade agreements, you will find that there are um, within the negotiations a little bit of, of give and take on those kind of areas. So this isn't unusual for this free trade agreement. But um, I, I think it's just with COVID on top of everything else, every country at the moment is trying to juggle and handle both. And it's it's just really difficult. Could we actually get to the end transition and fish could still be, or the, the, the whole, <laughs> the price of fish, the fish would actually end up sort of staying there at the end of the day. It would be, it could be set in the bay and so we could just get on with it. 
I suspect from everything that's happening, what well, the EU are saying that they want to keep it the same as it is for, for another 10 years. And it might be that we go back in and say, well, look, you can't do that. We'll, we'll come to an arrangement where we reduce percentages and we'll do that for the next three to five years and then talk about it again later. All right. Listen, it's going to be a cracking show today. Uh, really looking forward to it. A lot of people don't seem to really understand uh, what the consequences are and what this is all about. We're looking at commercial shipping invoices. It's it's an interesting area. For those people who don't really understand exactly what this is all about, can you just give us a brief explanation a little bit about what, what we mean by commercial shipping invoices and who they relate to? So in the same way that, that when you send any goods to a customer, you provide an invoice. And generally speaking, that invoice is a sales invoice. And the idea is you send the invoice and you get paid. But with a shipping invoice, there is an awful lot more information on a shipping invoice that needs to be put together and prepared for the freight forwarders and the hauliers to be able to get your goods through customs. Now, because we are part of the EU, and we're just talking about the EU here, by the way, um, we haven't had to worry too much about that over the past um, 40 years because um, we, we've got, we, we don't have to pay tariffs, for example, so we don't have to worry about tariffs. So the paperwork could go to the haulier with a, with a simple uh, shipping invoice and the haulier was able to just send it to whatever country in the EU that uh, you needed to, uh, to send it to. But from the 1st of January, we have to um, put all of the additional information onto the invoice before it will be allowed to go into the EU. So there may well be tariffs. Uh, there will be security and safety declarations, um, health and safety issues, licensing, all of that sort of thing. And when you send your shipment to the haulier, they need to know that you filled all of that information out on your shipping invoice before they can actually do their bit to get it to the border, to get it across to whichever country you're sending it to in the EU from the 1st of January. And the problem that you've got is that, especially SMEs, and it's especially if SMEs have not shipped internationally outside of the EU, they will never have done this before. It's so who, who's the responsibility with Lynn? The responsibility is with the trader. The trader has or exporter has got to be the one that fills out the commercial invoice properly and correctly, because if there is any comeback from HMRC, so for example, the duty that you have to pay, the VAT that you have to pay, if you filled it out incorrectly and underpaid, they will come after you and not the freight forwarder. There are a lot of SMEs at the moment that are saying, my freight forwarder does that for me, my haulier does that for me. They can't do that for you from the 1st of January. They can help you, but even if they give you some advice on the commercial invoice, it is your responsibility to get it right. And you can't blame the haulier or the freight forwarder if you get it wrong. I mean, we are talking about a huge amount of paperwork here. Was it 215 million additional forms have to be filled in? Do we actually have the resources here in, in the UK to be able to, to do that amount of paperwork? The logistics of just doing that paperwork seems to be nearly sales prevention in, in its most perfect form. Um, yes, you're right. There are 200, I think it's 213 million pieces of paperwork that will be spread out over 2021. That's additional paperwork on top of what we fill out at the moment. And, and as I said, if you get that wrong, um, the penalties could be severe. And, and traders just don't understand that they have got to be able to fill out that paperwork. Because if you think about it, if the freight forwarder has got to declare what's in the package, the only people that know what are in the package are the people that are going to ship it, obviously, how how it's made up, um, what, the, what the components are, that sort of thing. So they've got to, and the, um, the certificates and export licenses and so on, um, generally speaking, the, the trader has to apply for those and get those before shipment. Well, in that case, then, let's look at the actual role of the commercial invoice and, and why it's so important and, and what the function of the commercial invoice is. Now, I know we've got a graphic here. If you could just talk us through the key points of this, it would be really helpful, I think, for, for many of our viewers who are watching this at the moment. OK, so as I said before, generally speaking, your invoice is something that you would use to collect payment. But a, a 
with the commercial invoice for shipping, it's not just a tool for collecting the payment. It plays a, a much bigger role. Um, so for customs purposes, the, um, the invoice has got to show who the consigner is, who the kind consignee is, the address it's coming from, the address that it's going to, the invoice number, the PO number. Um, have you actually got the correct commodity code on the invoice, which we'll, we'll talk about later. The commodity code generally is telling um, the, the, um, the customs more or less what's in the package and how it's made up. Um, so then we're looking at delivery and risk, which is INCO terms. An awful lot of traders will have no idea what INCO terms actually are. And they are they decide how it's being delivered and who bears the risk while it is being shipped to wherever, wherever it is going. Um, and then, of course, there's the origin of the goods. Now, at the moment, we have an arrangement with the EU where we, we can just say it, that the goods are of UK origin and, and it can be shipped without a problem because we're part of the EU. But from the 1st of January, and, and this is key with the, the agreement that's being agreed at the moment, um, they may only accept a certain percentage of the way that the goods are made up to come from the UK. In addition to which, if we are putting other goods within there as part of the manufacturer that are coming from, coming from countries all over the world, what percentage of, of that is making up the goods? What uh, Do the EU accept goods from those countries? So it can get quite complicated and you have to make sure that you quote the correct commodity code on your invoice. Um, and also that the, the goods are of the correct origin, which is acceptable by the EU. And then you need to get a certificate of origin to go with your goods, which you can get from your local chambers of commerce. So as you can see, it's quite complex. There are licenses that you will require before you can send anything that you may have to. So, for example, um, there, there may be controlled goods that you're sending. And by controlled goods, I mean the, uh, dual use goods. So it might be you're sending them for one reason, but they could also be used for military purposes, for example. So um, the, 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 more... import, the important things then that need to be on the invoice. We've got, we've got some here, in fact, I think. Yes. Um, so, as I said, the consigner and consignee details... Uh, where the goods are coming from and going to invoice number, PO number, commodity code, EORI number. Uh, now, the EORI number is very important. At the moment, businesses have an EORI number, which is an EU EORI number. And up until the 1st of January, you can continue to use that for UK goods. But from the 1st of January, you will need a UK EORI number. And if you are shipping to Northern Ireland, you will need an XI EORI number. Um, so that's just talking about um, the origin of the goods and so on, uh, where the goods originate from. So you will need to do that. If you if you need to apply for one, you can apply online for that in the on the government websites. You will need on the invoice the description of the goods, the quantity of the goods, the cost, the currency, how much they weigh. And with regard to the, um, the cost of the goods, that's the value of the goods. You have got to get that right because that will determine how much VAT is paid and possibly how much duty is paid. If you get that wrong and you under declare, um, HMRC will come after you for that too. When, when we look at this, um, uh, uh, obviously we haven't had to be doing this in the past. Uh, or not at least to this extent, to this kind of detail. A lot of people are thinking that if we get a trade deal, they won't have to do this anyway. Is, is that the case, or or no. do you, or is that a misunderstanding? It is a misunderstanding. If we have a deal, that will affect tariffs, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there will be no tariffs. It might be that we we negotiate a reduced tariff, perhaps for certain goods. But tariffs do, uh, are not the reason for the customs declarations. The customs declarations are about uh, origin, about the safety of the goods, uh, that sort of thing. So you have to remember that the free trade agreement is about tariffs, but we still have to, from the 1st of January, do customs declarations, whether there is a deal or not. You still have to do that paperwork. Am I right in thinking that um, the same applies actually to our friends and close working colleagues 
in the EU as well. This has actually been imposed on them too. So they are exporting to us here in the UK, then they have to do exactly the same paperwork. So this isn't just a one-way street. It is both ways, isn't it? It is both ways. You're absolutely right, Steve. And um, with regard to that, uh, because of the way that we've been dealing with the EU, uh, we haven't had to worry about... Um, delivery costs and that sort of thing and who's responsible for the VAT on the other side uh, and we will have to from the 1st of January and that works both ways but what we're finding is that some EU companies who buy from the UK are insisting that the UK companies uh, take responsibility for the shipping and all of the customs duties on the other side of the channel as well. Um, so that that's part of Inco terms. Uh, and some of the businesses in the UK are saying, well, hang on a second, no, because that, that would cost us an awful lot more to get the um, e equipment or whatever it merchandise to you. And we're not prepared to do that. So there's negotiations going on around what the delivery terms are going to be and who pays for what. And it works both ways. Now, I'm a relatively simple man. I don't really know very much about anything in particular. Uh, but And you mentioned earlier on commodity codes. And I, I think a lot of people probably don't understand exactly what a commodity code is and how that applies to their business. So can you explain a little bit about what commodity codes are? Yes. Now, a commodity code really effectively describes your goods. So, for example, if you were to be sending out... Um, Woolen jumpers, for example. Um, what's the woolen jumper made of? What are the materials within it? Does it have buttons on it? How are the material in the buttons included? Um, is it pure wool? Is it, is it um, uh, some other kind of material that you're using? And so the commodity code breaks down exactly the way that the materials are made up in your goods. Um, and the reason that we use commodity codes rather than a, a written description is that, of course, numbers are universal. So it, it's a kind of world thing, if you like, where everybody understands what the codes mean rather than you just saying sh uh, woolen jumpers with buttons. So um, the commodity codes are made up of um, eight, 10 and 14 digits. Eight are for exporting, 10 are for importing, and 14, the extra four digits are used, for example, for anti-dumping duties, possibly controlled goods. By anti-dumping duties, I'm talking about things like um, steel, for example. Um, we had a huge problem with China dumping steel here, and that was causing an issue. So there are anti-dumping issues there, so you have to add on the additional codes. So the code can be quite long. You can go to the government website that shows you how to find the codes, um, and how to apply them to your goods. But it is like a drill down effectively so that you've got the whole of the code that goes onto your commercial invoice, which describes what is in that package. But it's it, very it, important to get it right. It seems to me at the moment, I mean, we're talking there that we are sharing the commodity codes uh, from a list that the EU are also using, and we're going to uh, continue using those commodity codes into 2021. But after yeah. that, they may they may start to drift apart. Well, that, that kind of seems to me that we're slowly but surely going to get a bit of a muddle if we've got two different systems and different commodity codes uh, working at the same time. What, what What's going to happen after that? Or will, do you feel long term the commodity codes will stay pretty uniform uh, not only here in the uk but across the eu as well uh, i think that any changes that are made to the commodity code here in the uk um, will be a, a transitional thing if you if you will so during 2021 it will be eased in as we start to go through the process of exporting and importing and, and tripping over perhaps issues that we might find over the next year or two years. So although um, we are saying that we'll probably change the commodity codes in 2021, it's probably going to be nearer to the end of 21, 22. And it, it will again be an education process for the trader. I think I have an observation. A jumper doesn't have buttons, a cardigan does, doesn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it might it might have buttons on it for embroidery purposes thank you very much indeed Not for sorting me purposes. out and putting me in my place 
All right, in just a moment, then we're going to find out what a commodity code is actually used for. More from Linda in just a moment on this edition of Business Connections Live. And as always, it's great to have your company with us uh, here on the programme today. I hope you're finding it interesting. And as we said at the beginning, we do live in interesting times. We promised we wouldn't say that, but there you go. Uh, we've said it now. Let's go back a week, shall we? Uh, last week, we had Anne-Marie Cross. She was on the program. We were talking about podcasting. Is it something you should be considering doing when we go into 2021? Is that the thing that will change the fortunes of your business along with everything else that's going on? Is podcasting going to be right for you? And what are the things you should be considering when it comes to podcasting? Great show last week. Don't forget, you know, go to the website to watch the entire program. But if you don't have the time to do that, here are the key takeaways from last week's edition of Business Connections Live. So Anne-Marie Cross, also known as the Podcasting Queen, helping you go from invisible to influential and profitable with a podcast. If you want to build your reach, your reputation as a trusted authority, as well as your revenue from your very first uh, podcast, then uh, some of these principles will certainly help you. So just to recap some of the major points that I shared, don't worry about the make and model of the microphone, focus first on your message. Because when you add a robust podcast strategy on top of that, it means your podcast is going to cut through the noise and and be able to really position you as that trusted authority. Make sure you've got clarity on your lucrative niche. Don't worry about vanity numbers, focus on reputation equity. How are you different? How are you showing up consistently and ensure that you bring that across in each and every episode, whether you're interviewing someone or whether you are doing a solo show. Secondly, or thirdly, make sure that you're really clear on what I call your thought leader brand and message. And this is spending some time so that if someone was to keep compare your message and your brand to someone else who's in your industry, it is not only distinguishable, it is uncopyable and irresistible. And what I mean by that, the story that you are sharing across your podcast episodes, if someone were to remove you, your name and add their name and the story that you're sharing is similar, that means you're actually copyable, you're not uncopyable. So take some time to really cut, to get clarity on that key message and story that makes you unique. So do that and bring that across each and every podcast episode that you share. Uh, what's one other one that I want to share with you? Last but not least, make sure your call to action has people come, your ideal client who are ready to take that next step to go from your podcast to your list. And that is to really think about the first three episodes or if you've already launched a podcast, you can create a three-part series, special series and start seeding and leading with your existing audience and say, hey, this is coming up. And in fact, actual fact, what I would do was I would engage your audience and find out what are some of the key triggers and challenges that they're faced with now and create that podcast series around that and launch that so that you have a call to action and opt-in that has some strategic emails to nurture those listeners into those leads and then inquiries. And then every single time that you have that call to action or you, if you're doing a podcast, guesting strategy or even you're part of mainstream media and you're being interviewed you can use that as your opt-in and continue to build your list and work with awesome clients if you want to find out more about my work uh, go to podcastingwithpurpose.com forward slash quiz and if you're wanting to find and get a copy of the book and find out more about that industrythoughtleaderbook.com will take you there Anne-Marie Cross there, fantastic program. If you get an opportunity to actually watch the program, I do suggest you go to our website uh, to find out more. If you'd like to appear on the program, maybe you are the font of all knowledge, maybe there's something within your industry sector uh, that you'd like to share with everybody, maybe you just want to raise your profile as an industry expert, well, why don't you get in touch with us here at Business Connections Live? Dead easy to do. All you've got to do is drop us an email to studio at businessconnectionslive.com. Better still, and um, probably... Considering COVID's all around us at the moment, it might be just as good to pick the phone up and give us a call on 01784 256 777. Don't forget, you can also follow our stream of consciousness here at BCL Business TV. And if you want to watch over 400 hours of great business advice and programs from our experts, then go along to our website at businessconnectionslive.com. It's as easy and as straightforward as that. 
You're watching Business Connections Live. Great to have your company as always today. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching the program, regardless of whether you're watching this live or you're watching it on Catch Up. My guest on today's program is Linda Bazant, and uh, we've been talking about all things uh, when it comes to commercial invoices and what's important about them. So far, we've got on to commodity codes. Commodity codes we've talked about, they describe the particular item that you're exporting. Uh, and obviously, the EU, when they're sending goods to us, they too will carry a commodity code with them so that we can identify them, or at least our customs operatives can identify them when they're coming to the country. Is that correct, what I'm saying? Uh, yes, pretty pretty much, Steve. It, it's uh, it, it's uh, obviously a, a EU UK thing. All right then. So, um, what is a commodity code then normally used for? Right. Okay. So you're looking at calculating tariffs. Now, I spoke earlier about the free trade agreement. It may be that if we come to a deal and there is a free trade agreement, it doesn't necessarily mean no tariffs at all. Dependent on the type of commodity, there might be a small tariff to pay, perhaps depends on what the negotiations come up with. So a commodity code is used for calculating the appropriate tariff that has to be paid on that particular piece of merchandise. Um, it monitors controlled goods. And I spoke earlier about controlled goods. It may well be that it's a dual use good where, for example, radar equipment might be going out. It can be used for military purposes as well. So you would need to have a specific license for that to be able to go. And that will be reflected in the commodity code that you use for that particular um, piece of merchandise. Uh, quota controls. Quota controls is, is kind of anti-dumping, really. So it's just making sure that we don't end up with too much here of what we've either already got. And it causes a problem for an industry that we have in our country that could be um, a competition. Um, trade policies, um, sanctions, for example. There are different countries that we deal with that have particular sanctions. So that goes back almost to the um, origin that I spoke about earlier. Where have the goods come from? Where have the components come from? There might be some countries that aren't particularly keen on the components that we use from another country because there are sanctions in place. So some, that's something you need to address as well. And very important, HMRC audit, can audit you to make sure that you are using the correct commodity codes when you declare your goods, to make sure that you are not under declaring for VAT purposes, for example. And they can actually come in and audit to make absolutely certain that you have got all of the appropriate paperwork for export, that you have used the, the correct commodity code. If they find you have used an incorrect commodity code, they could go back over every commodity code you've ever used on everything that you've ever exported and imported. So you have to, and of course, if they find emissions and errors, you could be fined an awful lot of money. I, so I know that's that's the that. I know that's the frightening bit about all of this. But up until recently, of course, commodity codes haven't been that important, have they? From uh, somebody once told me that what people have just been doing, they've been filling in any old commodity code on the export forms just to get the goods out there. We've just got well, to actually do doing, the system. They've actually taken the first commodity code available, used that for the EU. And uh, what that has resulted in is that this country, the UK, we ship more horses to the EU than we have ever had <laughs> in this particular country in the first place. So that will, of course, all change on the 1st of January. Your commodity code has got to be accurate and correct. I, su I suppose, in fairness, then, we should have been doing this like correctly anyway, shouldn't we? Yes, we should have done, but it, it, obviously there, there wasn't the, the policing around it, but there will be now. And, uh, of course, one of the other things, just going back to the HMRC audit, um, because of COVID, and because of Brexit, um, people are assuming that, um, that it won't be too much of an issue. HMRC won't have the time to do it, so it doesn't really matter. Well, it does matter because HMRC have been very swiftly uh, engaging new people to work for them to cover all of this from the 1st of January. And although they may be very, very busy, uh, January, February, March, just dealing with the way that the whole thing is going to work. Remember that once they've actually got that under control, they will have all of these additional HMRC officers 
that will start auditing businesses to make sure that they're doing the right thing. So please don't be complacent about the fact that HMRC won't have the time to come and audit you because eventually they will. There you go. There's a warning for you. Um, you, you mentioned earlier on a thing called Inco terms. Yeah. Uh, up until recently, I've never ever heard of this expression, haven't got a Scooby-Doo what it means. And I would imagine a lot of business owners will have no idea what Inco terms are all about. What are Inco terms? Inco terms are international commerce terms. And it's very important to understand that these terms are about delivery and risk. And they are incorporated into a sales agreement, but they are not necessarily the sales agreement. They're not part, part of the legal document necessarily, but it's important for businesses to incorporate INCO terms into the agreement so that later on, if there are any issues with regard to who delivered what where, what the risk was, if the, if the goods go missing, if, if the ship sinks, for example, or if there are... Um, perhaps uh, issues around insurance, who is responsible for what. Uh, and they are called INCO terms. They're used not just in the EU, but internationally all around the world, which means that everybody understands exactly what terms they are dealing in. And they range from uh, XWorks. And XWorks is, for example, if you have, let's go back to our woolly jumpers again. So you've got boxes of woolly jumpers and you've sold them to somebody in Spain. And the, the Spanish buyer has arranged for a truck to come to your factory to pick up those boxes. And the second they pick them up from your factory, it becomes their responsibility. They're responsible for the shipping, for putting it on a ship, for sending it abroad, for sending for um, bringing it into customs on the other side and for making sure that it gets delivered to whichever factory or um, perhaps retailer it's going to in the EU. So that's X works. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, and there are 11 INCO terms, by the way, so in between X works and DDP, which is deliver duty paid, deliver duty paid means that when the buyer in Spain says, I want to buy X woolen jumpers from you and I need you to the, deliver them to this address in Spain, you are responsible for getting them from your factory down to the dock, onto the ship, getting making sure that the ship arrives at the other end, for getting them off the ship at the other end, for putting through, through customs at the other end, for VAT at the other end, putting them on a truck, and then getting them shipped to the, um, the retailer's premises in Spain. And that costs a lot of money. So you need to be very careful when you are negotiating your INCO terms whether you actually do want DDP terms or whether you want something either X works or in between, because remember, on DDP terms, you have to pay for everything and it costs a fortune. Whereas at the moment, it's not really been an issue because of the way that everything goes backwards and forwards between the EU and the UK. It's not been an issue. So if you have got a sales agreement with an EU customer, please double check what INCO terms you've actually got within your agreement because it may well be that you haven't really paid that much attention over the past few years because it wasn't necessary but you need to look at it now and also any agreements going forward make absolutely certain that you nail down what those delivery and risk options are going to be within your INCO terms before you agree the sale. I would imagine that uh, most people will only be familiar with X Works or Landed uh, landed costs and all the other INCO terms uh, are going to be quite alien to them. Is, do you find that, is that the case? Do, are people as familiar with these terms as they should be? No, it, to most traders, especially if they've only ever dealt with the EU and not uh, internationally, they would have no idea what you're talking about. And it's something they need to familiarise themselves with. Um, however, I will say here that the freight forwarder and the haulier can help with that because, of course, they're doing it all of the time. Um, so they can help you and advise you. But the problem that you that what they can't do, of course, is um, make the arrangements with the buyer or negotiate with the buyer as to exactly what terms will be acceptable to both sides. Um, they can just advise you as to what the terms mean and what your exposure is going to be. Over the last couple of months, we've heard from uh, from the states from Trump during his presidency uh, that 
the the origin of parts of the goods is quite important to them. Where do the chips come from, particularly in technology, high-tech equipment? Uh, where did the chips or, originate from? American uh, semiconductors and semi and components being used in Chinese manufacturing plants and things like that. And, of course, the it's all about the origin of the goods. How important is the origin of the goods going to be as we move forward past transition and into just trading normally with the EU? Uh, well, of course, at the moment, when our goods go out, um, we are able to put on their EU origin because we're part of the EU. But from the 1st of January, uh, goods that we produce in this country with components that we've produced here will be of UK origin, um, usually up to about 60% possibly. And then, of course, what you've got to look at is, say, the other 40%, well, where did that come from? Um, and also what you need to remember is that there might be some countries within the EU that are happy to accept components from one country. So, for example, France might say, well, yes, we're happy to accept X percentage from that country. But you might find that Spain say, well, actually, no, we're not happy with that. Our rules are different. So although the EU 27 are are joined, some of the countries have their own rules and regulations with regard to the origin of goods and how, how that is made up in, in the percentage, for example. Um, so you will need to, to look at the origin of your goods from the 1st of January. Uh, you, can, you can take advice. Um, you'll find that your chambers of commerce will be extremely helpful because they will actually also be preparing the certificate of origin, which confirms exactly what components you have in your goods that are going out with the commercial invoice. It's, it's, it is a very difficult situation, all of this, isn't it? And you can see that there's going to be a lot of that, you know, we were talking about 250 billion pieces of additional paper. Do, do you honestly believe we've got the resources to do all of that? Or, or, or do most businesses actually, or most freight, freight forwarding companies, do they already have the resource there? And really, they're just stepping up a bit more because was it something like 50% of our trade is on WTO rules anyway? So they've just got to kind of up the effort a little bit. Well, our freight forwarders and hauliers know exactly what they're doing because they deal with international freight all of the time. The problem for them is making sure that the people that are sending them the freight for them to ship know exactly what to put in the documentation that they need. Otherwise, they have the problem that they arrive at the port and because their customer hasn't provided them with the correct information, everything gets held up at the port and probably refused and sent back and they can't afford to be put in that position, which is why they need to make sure that traders know what they're doing. Um, and usually you'll have an intermediary so they have a customs intermediary, a customs broker, if you will, who will be able to help you with that sort of thing. But because we haven't really needed that many customs brokers over the past 40 years, um, we now find ourselves in a position where that we are down 50,000 customs brokers to act as intermediaries between traders and freight forwarders to get the um, all of the documentation put forward correctly. And, and that is a, a huge issue at the moment. I read somewhere, and I may be getting this completely wrong, but there were job opportunities in this particular area, but they were offering something like £25,000 and three years' experience. So it, it it's, you know, we're, we're, we're really in the catch-up mode here. Is this where it's going to fall over? Is this where we're, we're going to trip up with our trade with the EU, do you think? Well, uh, you may be interested to know that just in the paper this morning, um, there is an article with regard to uh, customs intermediaries being able to command £25,000, but obviously they need the appropriate experience. That has now, in the space of just the past few weeks, gone up to £35,000 because they can't get the people to apply. And well, also, are, it may well be that the, the issue is not just people can't apply, but perhaps they don't have the appropriate experience because some customs intermediaries will have only ever dealt with the EU and therefore they don't know about all of this other paperwork or at least not as in depth as is needed to be able to advise their customers. Is, is this relatively straightforward? Is it something that people can learn? Is it, Or is it a case of, last week I couldn't spell it, now I are one? Is it, is it one of those? I mean, can people quite quickly get up to speed with this? I think, uh, just to, to, to bring it down a notch and not panic people too much, we're talking about commodity codes and rules of origin and so on. Um, and we have to remember that these people are not shipping 
everything. They're not shipping all of the, the manufacturing that we do in this country. They're just shipping the one thing that they ship. So let's go back to the woolen jumpers again. If they're just shipping woolen jumpers, if they go onto the government website and find out what the commodity code is for what they ship, it should be quite straightforward. Rules of origin are going to be a bit more difficult, but they can get advice. Um, so I, I, th I think we have to stand back a bit and, and traders have to think, well, what exactly is it that I ship? What do I need to know about for my manufacturing, for my commodity codes? Um, where do I get all of my materials from to make up what I ship? So I think if you drill down into it a little bit more, it's not going to be phenomenally difficult but it's going to be a learning curve right at the very beginning. Because if you think about it, once these people start to put their commodity codes in and their rules of origin in, and they've been doing it for three or six months, it becomes part of what they do every day and it will start to calm down. But initially, I, 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 people are I do going remember to have problems. And I do remember you once saying that um, it takes six months for somebody to get into a new job anyway. Yeah. Um, Let's let's move on something else because it's you know commodity codes, uh, commercial invoices, ORI numbers. What are they all about then? And um, is that how you pronounce them? E O R I. What's that? ORI. Um, so they are an economic operator registration and identification number. So it, it very basically identifies the fact that you are an exporter and importer and that you have applied for your EORI number. And, and we've all got EU or EORI numbers at the moment. But from the 1st of January, you will need a UK EORI number. And if you are shipping to Northern Ireland, you will need an XI EORI number. Uh, you can apply for them um, online. And the problem that you will have, and it does get complicated here, but again, your freight forwarder and haulier can help you with this, is that if you are shipping from the 1st of January from the UK to the EU, you will need a UK EORI number from here to the port. And if you're going to the other side, uh, where they are bringing it in as an import, you will need... An, an EU EORI number there for it to be accepted into the EU. So you may need uh, perhaps an intermediary in the EU, a representative to act on your behalf. Um, EU EORI numbers um, can be applied for by a, a, a any country within the EU, but the easiest to apply it to is Southern Ireland and also, also the Netherlands are the, are the easiest to get through all of the hoops and so on for you to get your EU EORI number. And it may be that if you've got a subsidiary in the EU, that's not too much of an issue for you anyway, but you do need to double check all of these things. Um, and um, EORI numbers is, is obviously a much bigger subject than we can cover here so that we can go in depth to, to explain in, in detail exactly how each one works and how, how to get one and what the consequences are for you if you don't have them. I understand that there is a bit of a delay here in the UK. I mean, along with COVID and everything else, there, there is a bit of a delay uh, to actually get your numbers um, online here, isn't there? Uh, it's not too bad, actually. If you apply online here for your UK EORI number, you should be able to get one pretty quickly. And also um, HMRC wrote to um, everybody that had a VAT number in the country this year, um, explaining that um, they needed a UK EORI number. And in most cases, if you had a VAT number, you got your EORI number automatically. But there's still, still maybe some traders that don't have it and they need to contact HMRC to um to make sure that they've got theirs but a lot of them should already have them the problem is going to be getting your eu eori number from the first of january because what we're trying to negotiate is maintaining the eu eori number you've got at the moment um but the eu are being a bit intransigent and saying no you have to reapply for a new one there you go but what a surprise that is but you know it's just a another hurdle 
uh, for us to get over. Uh, we all like certificates. We all like licenses. We're going to talk about those in a few moments' time uh, right here on this edition of Business Connectors Live. My guest on today's show is Linda Bazan, and we are talking about what well, we started off talking about, the commercial invoices. It's kind of gone on from there. hope you're finding it useful, interesting information for you. Uh, and as we said, it's terminal at times at the moment. It's going to be a, it's going to be a difficult transition period because of COVID and everything else uh, that is going on. But there is a process there. There are things that can be done. And if we can tell you what you should be aware of, then that's what this program is all about. And you know, it's only politics, isn't it, at the end of the day, that's holding a lot of this up, along with, of course, COVID. Uh, But we should all be concentrating on what our business is doing. And let's go back to a program. This is Business Connections Live 273. One of the old friends of the program, Antonio Falco, he joined us on the program. He said, forget about the politics, concentrate on what your business is doing. Well, first of all, thank you very much for watching. I hope, uh, hope you've uh, had some entertainment, but you've learned something. Um, the one thing I'd say to you is that my name is Antonio Falco. I'm the sales director. I'm all about how we make the next sale. So if you've got a sales team that isn't performing, we need to talk. If you've got a business that isn't bringing the, the sales in, we need to talk. But fundamentally, what you need to do is review what your business is about. Do I know what I'm selling? Do I know who I'm trying to sell it to? Do I know why they're going to buy it? And have I set in place, in stone, targets to try and achieve? Because unless you do that, you're going to be just sailing off into the wind. And it is all about making absolutely certain you know where you are and you know what you're doing at the moment. Don't forget, you can watch that entire program, if you wish, simply by going to our website at businessconnectionslive.com. Uh, that's businessconnectionslive.com. You'll find over 400 hours of great programs there for you to watch as well, and I hope you enjoy watching them. Good to have your company with us today. You are watching Business Connections Live, and my guest on today's show is... Linda Bazant. There she is. Linda, lovely to have you with us. Um, just before the break, we were talking uh, about um, uh, U- U- Uri numbers. Uri numbers. Uri numbers. Uri numbers there. Um, now we're going to talk about licenses and certificates. And we all like a certificate uh, occasionally. Tell us more about uh, the licenses and the certificates that we're going to need. Okay. So, for example, if you are exporting perhaps pharmaceutical products, animal products, um, you're going to need specific certificates to be able to export them from the 1st of January. Um, And an awful lot of companies would probably have been doing that anyway if they export and import that type of product. Um, But you need to make absolutely certain that you have those certificates um, available for that that type of product if that's what you're shipping. Um, You also need Open General Export Licence and OGEL if you are shipping dual use products, which we discussed before, as I said, it may well be that you have something that could be used for military use. So you'll need an open general export license for that. Um, And we talked about origin and the fact that you would need a certificate of origin, which is provided by your chambers of commerce, they can do that for you. But what I would also say is that each different country that you deal with may have its own licensing requirements for different types of product. So as I said before, we may be dealing with the EU 27, but each country may have their own rules and regulations. So something that you can ship to France, for example, um, you might have to, when you ship to Spain, you might need an additional license for whatever it is. So you need to make sure that you are go onto the government website and have a look to see what licenses and certificates that you need. But having said that, when you put your commodity codes in, if within your commodity codes it decides that you need a license, it will advise you. It will say you need a license for this commodity code. And then you go onto the government website to apply for it. So this is all of the paperwork that you need to be able to ship your goods. So the system is there. We've got some form of a system at the moment that is actually um, helping us out when we go online. Is that is that true then? So we're not left, we're not being hung out to dry then? No, we're not being hung out to dry. There is an awful lot of information on the government website and it takes you through exactly how to go through the commodity codes, for example. Um, there are 
some companies that have issues around the commodity code because their particular product is so complex that they worry about getting the commodity code wrong. And what they can do is they can go to HMRC for a, a binding tariff information where they go to um, go to them on online and say, look, we think that our product is this code and it's made up of this. Could you please come back and confirm that this is the right code? And then HMRC can come back and say to you, yes, we think that's the right code or no, we don't. The only thing that I would um, advise on on this, though, is that they could come back and say, yes, that's the correct code. But if you've misinformed them, not necessarily on purpose, but if you've misinformed them, you might be thinking, well, HMRC have said it's OK, so it's not a problem. But if they ever come and audit you um, and they find that you've put the wrong code in, uh, saying to them, but you said it was OK, I'm afraid that's not going to fly. Which is the same whenever we deal with uh, HRMC. So so there we are. No, no change there then. We'll all be familiar with that. Uh, we started talking about commercial invoices. Um, wh where do we go to? Who do we submit these things to? Uh, can you give us some advice on that? Yes. Now, again, your freight forwarder, your haulier, will be able to help you with the submission of commercial invoices. Um, and as I said, they already do international trade. They know exactly what they're doing. And they will have appropriate software that will enable you to send the invoice electronically to them. But as I said to you, uh, as I said before, please make sure that you know that it is your responsibility to make sure that the information in the commercial invoice is correct because it will be you that HMLC comes after and not the freight forwarder and not the haulier. Okay, listen, um, fascinating hour. Obviously, there's going to be loads of questions that people are going to be asking about this uh, post the program. I'm going to ask you to give us the key takeaways from the program in just a few moments' time. But if people are looking for training and they're looking for more information about this, uh, where and what should they do? Uh, they can contact me, Linda, at lindabazant.com. Um, they can give me a call. I know that you're going to put all of my details up at the end of the show. Um, uh, they can go to my website, lindabazant.com. Um, I'm quite happy to either train one-to-one -one or group training if that's required, just to help businesses to understand exactly um, what they need um, with regard to the training so that they can comply with all of the information that I've given out today. This has been absolutely fantastic. Please, if you don't mind, uh, would you give us the key takeaways from today's program? That would be really helpful for us. So if you don't mind, say who you are, uh, what you do, and uh, the airways, Linda, are all yours. I'm Linda Bazant. I'm a barrister and international trade consultant. And on the program today, we've been talking about the commercial shipping invoice. Um, and for SMEs, small traders who haven't had to deal with this before or who have perhaps had a haulier or, or freight forwarder that's been able to deal with it, um, you will now have to make sure that you fill out all of the information on that invoice yourselves and accurately it will be your responsibility as the trader to make sure it's correct so that you don't have HMRC coming into you to do an audit and perhaps finding out that you've underdeclared and you haven't paid the appropriate VAT or duty on the goods that you're shipping. So what you need to look at is consignee and consignor information, including address, PO number, invoice number, commodity codes, the origin of the goods, where have they come from, are they admissible in the country that you're sending them to, um, the value of the invoice, very, very important for a VAT purposes. So, for example, if you're selling to a distributor and you discounted the value, you have to show the discount on the invoice. That's very important. Um, the weight of the goods, um, making absolutely certain that all of the paperwork is up to date with licensing, for example. What licenses do you need? You can usually pick up the licenses that you need by the commodity codes that you enter. If you've got problems, you can go onto the government site. And um, if you're not sure of exactly what commodity code you need to use, especially if it's complex um, merchandise, you can go for binding tariff information to HMRC and they will come back to you and let you know if they think you're using the right code or not. So it's all about paperwork. And I'm also aware 
that there are some of the big freight forwarding companies at the moment that are instructing their customers that if they do not have the correct commercial shipping paperwork, they will not collect from them because it will hold them up at the port and it holds up everybody else's uh, merchandise as well. So please make sure that your documents are accurate and correct so that when they go to the freight forwarder, there are no holdups and they don't cause you any issues. Good luck. I hope everything goes well. But if you want more information from me, please contact me, linda at lindabazant.com or lindabazant.com, my website. And I'm very happy to help you out with more information and the training courses that I provide either one-to-one -one or on group. There you go. Proposition, resolution, call to action. They were all done in uh, one hit. Listen, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us on the program. If we were off the record, and I know we're not because we're broadcasting this, but if we were off the record, what is your gut feeling about where we are today? So what what is the date today? It's... It is uh, that we're recording this on Monday, the twenty first of December. What's your gut feel about the way negotiations are going, and the preparations that we've got in store at the moment for uh, transition and coming to an end at the end of the uh, the month? I'm going to ask you that question, Steve. How long is a piece of string? Go on, give me the answer. It is twenty seven and a half inches because I measured it once. So we, we are we really in that situation? We just don't know well, at the moment. As I said at the top of the program. We were supposed, this was supposed to have been finished yesterday, um, the 20th of, some did the 20th, 20th of December. Um, not, not that an awful lot of us thought that that was ever going to happen anyway. And it's just going on and on and on. This could go right up to the 31st of December. And even then, if there is some sort of an agreement, are there going to be things that are staggered over into 2021. We talked about fishing earlier and uh, what's going to happen with that. Is there going to be a three-year term, a five-year term, a 10-year term where we do um, different percentages and so on? At the moment, we don't know. And then, of course, uh, one of the things that we didn't discuss today, which is also an export-import issue, is data, personal data. Uh, from the 1st of January, we will be regarded as an inadequate country, a third country, if you will, by the EU. So that will mean that they will tell um, all the, the 27 countries that they're not allowed to transfer their EU citizens' personal data to the, U the UK unless they've got the appropriate uh, contracts in place, the uh, standard contractual clauses, uh, which have got to be set up now. Uh, between now and the 1st of January, we've got 11 days. I do feel that they are cutting their nose off to spite their face, and so maybe we're doing exactly uh, the same thing too. Listen, yeah. Linda, it's thank you very much. Uh -huh. It's a negotiation. It's a negotiation. Listen, Linda, thank you very much for joining us on today's program. If you do want to go to our website, uh, you can go along to the website here. You'll find all the information that you need to know about the services that Linda offers, and uh, it is lindabazant.com. Uh, and there we are. You can actually, we're stamping it in time now. Uh, 10 days, 9 hours, 56 minutes, and one second, zero seconds until the transition takes place uh, between the uh, the two the two uh, organizations, two nations, between us as a sovereign nation and the EU as a trading bloc. Thank you very much indeed for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the program. Uh, listen, I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Thanks a lot there, Lynn. Talk to you soon. Um, hope you enjoyed today's program. It's been a fascinating insight into what you need to be doing to prepare yourself for the future. And I hope it's been of some help to you today. You're not there on your own. That's the thing to remember about this. There are people out there who are waiting to help you to get this right. And we will get this right. This time next year, it will all be a vague memory and everything will be running smoothly. And on that bombshell, stay safe out there and have a very Merry Christmas from me, Steve Highland. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Business Connections Live, the UK's leading online business channel.